All right, hello. Um, as Chase said, my name is Dimitri. I'm an associate professor uh, in mechanical and aerospace engineering and uh, now astronomy here at Cornell. And um, I'm going to randomly talk to you about just this thing that I found myself working on recently, uh, which caused me to also think about some other things that may be of more direct use to this group, um, or maybe I'll just show off some cool computational toys that might be of some interest to some of you. But please, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions and um, uh, stop me if what I'm saying doesn't make sense. So uh, the reason that I started thinking about constraint programming is because through a series of things that are not at all my fault, I found myself uh, basically putting together my department's PhD admission process this year. Uh, and I know this feels like a random place to start, and it is, but but just bear with me for a couple of seconds because it turns out that part of this is is a very, very annoying combinatorial problem. And in particular, we get something like 500 PhD applications, and we would very much like to read each of these. And uh, for reasons that are probably self-explanatory, you would want more than one person reading each application. So at a bare minimum, you want a thousand reads of these 500 applications. And so you somehow have to allot these uh, reading assignments between however many faculty you can scrape up that are actually willing to do this for you. So the problem setup is I have a spreadsheet of all the applicants entered data, which includes some information about their stated interests. I have PDFs that contain all of the things that the applicants have actually submitted, and I can scrape together maybe 35 or so of my colleagues that are maybe willing to help me out here. I'm going to approach this from the standpoint that if you are a university professor, you probably are baseline super narcissistic because otherwise, why would you be willing to stand up for 150 minutes a week and listen to the sound of your own voice? Which means that you're probably subset of reading assignments would be the most relevant. So this is not actually a new thing. This is a very, very well-known problem known as an assignment problem or a generalized problem or a, uh, in some of the cases, a knapsack, problem, various things like that. But it's a problem where you are assigning one set to another set. And the solution to this problem is, I'm sorry, I've, for some reason, I'm losing my cursor. The solution to this problem is encoded by a Boolean matrix where you have all the possible combinations of reader to candidate or the set of things one to the set of things two. So each of these grid squares represents a Boolean value. And in my particular case, the constraints are such that if I sum down each of these columns, then I should get a value of exactly two because I want to assign exactly two readers per candidate. And if I sum across each of these rows, then I should get a value that is bounded by twice the number of candidates divided by the number of readers, roughly. So this particular problem, this just the assigning of Boolean values, uh, has many, many solutions. You could just start enumerating them until you hit a solution that works, and then you stop. But on top of this, what we actually want to do is we want to maximize some utility. So if I have a calculated utility, p i sub j for each of those grid squares, and I cross multiply it with the Boolean value, I want to find the maximum possible value of all this, which means that there's a single or possibly a small number of solutions. And I would actually have to enumerate through the full set of solutions before I could find that. And that's hard because the enumeration of all those solutions has something like two to the 500 by 35 possible outcomes. And if you got your computer started enumerating that, it would be done around sometime by the heat death of the universe. It's also a number that Python floating point refuses to actually render uh, as a curious quirk of numerical encoding. You can get Python to admit that this number exists as an integer, but not as a floating point value, which I personally think is um, hilarious. Uh, but I have an odd sense of humor, obviously. So to make things even harder, um, 
I am going to also make it so that some readers, you know, the people that I like have fewer assignments and some readers have more assignments, but for the readers that have more assignments, they should have within plus or minus two of the same number. And I'm going to define that utility based on my first supposition that people like to read about themselves as one point if the applicant's stated interests inter intersect with each of the reader's stated concentrations, and we have a limited number of enumerated concentrations that people are allowed to, to choose, so it's, it's relatively straightforward to calculate this, plus five points if the person actually mentions a given reader by name that the reader, with the reader assigned to their application. Um, you get the names by scraping the PDFs, and just as an aside, this has nothing to do with the combinatorial problem, but scraping PDFs is, is a thankless and utterly horrible process. Uh, if you have anything else that you can do to solve your problem, I highly recommend it because being given a general unformatted, you have no idea what's in a PDF and being asked to do pattern matching against a list of names is just, is the worst thing that you can be asked to do. Um, I should also mention that in this process, I found out that one of my uh, graduate field members has a last name of U, as in Y-O-U. Uh, and that's the point when I started to cry because that means that I have a literally 100% pattern match against one person. We also have faculty members named Green and Young and Zhang. Um, and as you can imagine, the number of false positives is staggering. But enough complaining. I did it, I coded it up. Did you know basically threw up my hands at the false positives and then decided to live with them and set up the optimization problem? This class of general assignment problem is technically either depending on what particular literature you read, it's either um, NP complete or NP hard, which essentially means that if you use a modern tool designed to solve this type of problem, you're either going to get a solution almost right away if your hardware can support it or maybe it's infeasible and you'll never get a solution, or maybe your hardware is just not quite there and you're gonna waste a lot of time searching an answer and it's probably not going to. So one of the kind of completely ad hoc things that I can say about this whole thing is that if you don't get a solution right away, then chances are you should be trying something else. Um, and the particular tool that I chose to use for this is something called OR tools, which is a combinatorial optimization suite produced by Google and released as open source. Uh, this is, in fact, the entire program. I'm skipping the uh, pre-processing material where I enumerate the, the readers. So I have an array of readers, I have an array of candidates, and I've also pre-computed that rewards function uh, that I defined on a previous slide. But other than that, you know, that's like another ten lines of Python. This is it. This is the whole thing. And uh, four seconds later on the same laptop that I'm using to speak to you right now, this spits out a provably optimal solution to my stated problem. I'm gonna hop over. So I'm gonna just kind of do ad copy for Google for a couple of seconds, uh, because it really is a, a really fantastic piece of code. Uh, and it's by no means unique. There's a lot of these uh, software suites out there. And one of the great things about OR tools is that it actually directly wraps a number of other commercial and open source products that many of you might be already using. So just um, as a quick example, uh, SCIP, which is sort of the granddaddy of mixed integer optimization solvers is directly built into here. Uh, and this is an open source and a very permissively licensed thing so that I, they can just redistribute it. Uh, it natively wraps uh, something called Groby, which is a commercial solver, but um, so this is SCIP, Solving Constraint Integer program, Programs. Groby is a commercial piece of software, but they have a very nice academic license. So anybody with uh, an EDU email and anybody associated with a university can basically request a limited time license and then just keep requesting it. Uh, and this is another really, really powerful mixed integer programming solver, uh, as well as a Boolean integer programming solver. This also has hooks potentially for things like CPLEX, which is IBM's optimization suite. Um, this one starts, you know, now we're starting to get into closed source and, and expensive things, but if you or your institution happens to have one of these, then you might as well be using it. But the cool thing is that through OR tools, you can be using it through a common interface, which means that you can write your optimization once and not have to use a specialized optimization language. You don't have to use an IDE from any of these things. You just write these in very straight, straight declaratory Python or C or whatever you happen to like, 
And um, you can run all the different solvers on it and see how the solutions compare to one another. Um, <clears throat> so it's a combinatorial optimization suite. It has native hooks for Boolean integer programming, mixed integer programming, all sorts of linear programming problems. And it has a satisfiability solver called CPSAT. Um, so for those for whom this terminology might not be uh, readily apparent, a satisfiability solver is just something that solves propositional satisfiability problems or Boolean satisfiability problems. So you're literally just trying to formulate your problem as a set of Boolean conjunctions and disjunctions, and then amass a series of Boolean variables such that the entire proposition of conjunctions and, and disjunctions evaluates the true. Uh, and again, that sounds relatively straightforward. And, and the conceptually, nothing about these systems is hard, but they're all sort of these empty complete type problems where you can trivially test any of the proposal solutions, but in order to enumerate all of the possible solutions would take an unreasonably long amount of time. And so you need to go and search for shortcuts. Uh, and I spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out exactly what CPSAT is doing under the hood. Uh, they provide very nice documentation in terms of how to use it and not as much about what it's actually doing. Uh, in the course of this, I came across this paper, which I can't say for certain that this is what's behind it, especially because this is now you know over a decade old, but I believe that this is kind of, um, Sorry, uh, I believe that this is along the path of what is happening inside of CPSAT. And if anybody here actually knows the right answer, I would I would love to hear it. Um, but as I said, the uh, available documentation is not super clear on exactly how they implement things. Uh, so this is this paper. As I said, I, I highly recommend it. You can just Google for the title, and it's uh, up on one of these researchers' um, homepage. Uh, I believe at Victoria, and it goes through this idea that you can do what they call lazy cost generation, which is basically a heuristic shortcut to actually trying to do the full SAT solver, which in itself is a very, very difficult task. You have to basically reduce the whole propositional sentence into one of a small handful of known forms, which itself is not always doable. Uh, and so they shortcut all that using some very, very clever logic uh, and, and Boolean games. And again, if you happen to be interested in this kind of stuff, I would very much urge you to, to take a look at this paper. So I'm going to jump back to my uh, ramblings. Um, as I said, I like OR tools because you, know, you don't have to learn a new optimization language. You're using the constructs of the language itself and the specialized structures that are, in, that are provided by this CP model class. And so CP model has the concept of a Boolean variable. And so you make a dictionary that mimics the array of Boolean variables. This is actually very closely following one of the canned examples from the OR tools documentation uh, in which they were doing uh, shift assignments for, I believe, for nurse scheduling, something like that. Um, you add constraints, which is just given by a add method for the model class. You add inequality constraints, which are stated exactly as inequality constraints. Again, if anybody's used other optimization languages, things like Ample, you know that sometimes you have to jump through hoops in order to explain relatively straightforward concepts like inequality constraints because of the, the declarative natures of non-declarative natures of those languages. And, so it's very nice to actually produce something that is an optimization problem in a completely legible form. And then you can provide maximization or minimization functions. And again, here, this is exactly encoding that. So this particular line, sum over, over rewards times assignments is ex exactly verbatim this expression. And it gives me a solution and I gave the assignments out to my colleagues and they were not at all pleased because I was asking them to do extra work, but you know, I explained that it was service and um, it seemed to work out okay. But this got me thinking about a completely different problem uh, that I had been working on for many years, but had, hadn't picked up in a while. Uh, and that might be a little bit more relevant to the people on this call. And that is, resource-limited science asset scheduling, which is just a super pretentious way of saying 
I have a camera or a spectrograph or, or what have you. And I have more science targets than I actually have integration time on this thing. And how am I going to maximize my science while allocating the resource that I have? And so the specific problem statement here is if I have some observing time on target I that I will call T sub I, I should, if I have a way of evaluating the expected utility as a function of that integration time, what I want to do is to maximize the sum utility such that I have allocated all of my time. Uh, this is written as a minimization of a negative summation, which is exactly the same as a maximization. Um, this C sub I as a function of T sub I, think of this as SNR, right? For example, if you have an SNR minimum, then you have science utility for clearing an SNR, which is obviously a function of your integration time, as an example. Uh, in the field of, of exoplanet imaging, which is the context that I work on this on, um, the C sub I represents a value called completeness, which is the probability of actually detecting a new planetary companion object, uh, making a lot of assumptions about the population of, of such objects that are out there to find. But there's a lot of you, I, I hope that you can envision a lot of instances where you can evaluate a utility value that is a function of how much time you've allocated to a specific observation. Um, so we're doing a constrained optimization. We are maximizing the sum utility for all of our alloc allocated times. And typically, because these are real instruments, you will have overheads. So your constraint is that you have some maximum total integration time or mission duration. You are going to subtract from this the sums of your allocated times. And you are also going to subtract from this the sums of your overheads for those, uh, for those targets that actually got time allocated to them. And this whole thing has to be greater than or equal to zero. If this expression is exactly equal to zero, then that means that you have perfectly ideally allocated all available time. If it's slightly greater than zero, that means that you've left some time on the table. And so maybe you are performing suboptimally, but maybe also there is no globally optimal solution that also matches this constraint. And of course, for any individual observation, the integration time has to be between zero and that maximum allowable time. Again, this is a thing that is super straightforward to write down and turns out to be super annoying to solve. And the reason why it turns out to be super annoying to solve is because this thing, this is what's known as an unfriendly constraint, or I guess maybe known just to me, but uh, this really breaks things. And one of the ways that it breaks things is that your a random initial guess is very likely to violate this constraint. And as an illustrative example, um, what I typically ask people to think of is, let's say that your overhead time to set up an observation is one day. Let's say that you have 365 days. You have one year of available integration time total. And let's say that you have 600 targets. Even if you allocated zero actual integration time to each of those 600 targets, if you try to observe all of them, then you would have more overhead time than you have available time. And so you're starting off this problem at a disadvantage because you cannot have a randomly generated proposal solution that actually matches this constraint for a very, very large number of problems. And in particular, the kinds of scheduling problems that I typically work on. Okay, so instead of doing that, we're gonna consider an auxiliary problem. And what we're gonna do is just, we're gonna assign a predetermined utility to each of our targets. So let's just say we, divide the entire maximum integration time evenly between all targets and we calculate what the utility would be. And now we are just trying to find the subset of the targets to select such that they're, we're maximizing their sum utility for a predetermined integration time for each one of them. And we can have many different ways of, of uh, pre-computing these things based on either, either an even distribution of time or trying to do something tricky with, with the time distribution, but it, it doesn't really matter because this problem can be directly rewritten as a Boolean integer programming problem. And that's good because this one we can actually solve using much the same tools that I was just talking about uh, when I was talking about OR tools. So this is just a vectorized form of the problem statement. And all that it's saying is that we are trying to select a vector X that has all zero one values such that we are solving this maximization. As I said, 
the auxiliary problem is a binary integer linear programming problem or BILP. And the full nonlinear problem is a nonlinear optimization that we are going to solve using sequential least squares quadratic programming or SLSQP. These are incredibly well understood pro problem classes, even though there's lots of active research in, in the efficient solution of each of these. And much like the uh, CP SAT style problems, the binary integer program problems are theoretically empty complete, but computationally, it turns out they are super cheap and completely feasible for reasonably sized target lists. And reasonable for the kind of hardware that I have access to, we're talking about thousand-ish targets, right? 10,000 is probably pushing it, but there's not a ton of resource limited observing programs that I personally am aware of that have tens of thousands of targets, although obviously giant surveys do. All right. So what this looks like is you set up this binary integer step again, using a coin branch cut, which is built into OR tools and CPLEX and Garobi and, and every single other solver out there. And uh, this is just showing, so this is now a specific example. I am selecting stars to observe because I'm looking for new exoplanet companions. Uh, the color scale represents the uh, V-band magnitude of the stars, uh, which is a good proxy for um, how long it's, I'm going to have to integrate for to hit a particular noise for. And the filled circles are the targets that get selected here, and the open circles are the uh, complement of my target list, so the unselected things that were on my original target list. And the size of these things is proportional on a logarithmic scale to how much time I've allocated to each of these. And you can see that in this step, I've basically allocated pretty much this. It's, it's on the order of hours for all of these and below a day. Um, and again, the claim here is not that this is by any means optimal. The claim is that I have now provided my quadratic programmer. I've now provided the nonlinear, very expensive solver with a feasible starting solution which is what that solver desperately needs. Because if I start the SOSQP with an infeasible solution, it's pretty much going to give up, you know, throw its hands in the air and say, go away. So this is just there to make the SLSQP step actually do something. And when you see that step with that initial solution, it then refines things. And so now the open circles have gone to these dots, which is Basically, they're in the target list. They have time allocated to them, but they effectively effectively have zero time allocated to them. And if you flash between these, you can see that one of the cool things that's happening here is that sometimes the open circles actually get converted to true targets. As the time gets reallocated in this iterative solution process, you actually will get some of the targets that are previously discarded being brought back because we can maximize the summed utility a little bit more if those are targets are included versus if they're thrown away. So by doing this pre-processing step, you're actually not cutting off any viable science target from possible observation. You're just allowing the solver to do what it needs to do in order to decide correctly whether or not those targets should be included. And of course, caveats here are that you get slightly different solutions depending on how exactly you seeded that pre-processing step. But in general, it, it works. And we wrote this up in 2017. and. Um, uh, showed that it actually does a, a reasonably good job for a wide variety of initial guesses. And you can do this dynamically, right? You can do this as you proceed through the actual ex execution of a mission plan, continuously reevaluating things. And this is this very, very busy plot is just showing that we're basically plotting the remaining sum completeness, remaining sum utility for two different approaches to scheduling things, one which is just a greedy scheduler that's constantly trying to maximize the utility versus a slightly less greedy scheduler that's trying to maximize the ratio of utility to the time that you're actually allocating per target. Um, and so the, uh, the dots are the remaining sum completeness from the optimizer and the bigger dots, the ones that are climbing are the actual achieved sum completeness of your observations. Uh, and eventually, you can see that for the greedy one, you run out of time much faster in terms of observations than if you're doing the non-greedy version. Um, but in terms of how much actual completeness you amass, how much actual utility you've gathered, uh, they're very comparable with the non-greedy version just edging out the greedy version ever so slightly. Um, gonna skip this and just kind of move on to the punchline, which is 
what we actually want to solve is something called the time window to online price collecting dynamic traveling salesman problem. This in general, when you're scheduling these, these surveys, um, astronomical or otherwise, uh, these are essentially traveling salesman problems because uh, they're price collecting traveling salesman problems because you are trying to amass utility as you go along and you can describe them as a directed graph where the nodes of the graph represent observations and the edges of the graph represent the cost of transitioning between observations. If you are ground-based, then transitioning between observations usually has no cost or equal cost to it, right? Modulo, you know, your telescope has a slew rate limit. For example, it might be a little bit more costly to like, you know, change by hundred degrees in azimuth than it is to change 10 degrees in azimuth. But um, other than that, it's, you can go from one target to another very rapidly. If you're talking about scheduling space assets, it might actually be very expensive because you are definitely rate limited on your sewing capabilities. And if you have a formation flying solution, like in the case of certain exoplanet imaging uh, concepts that involve formation flying solutions to the um, uh, starlight suppression system, then you're, you pay an enormous cost in terms of time for retargeting between things. So the dynamic side of this is that, especially if you're talking about space-based assets, everything is constantly moving. Your orbits, your orbital motion keeps changing your uh, geometry of the system. And so the whole thing is constantly evolving, which means that you can't write down a closed form solution. And finally, it's time windowed because whether you're ground-based or space-based, there are certain locations that you can't look at at certain times. You can't point near the sun, right? And you can't point through the earth. And so you have specific time windows when you're actually allowed to schedule. And so this whole problem that we stated as an optimization before gets two more constraints. And this T, I, T sub I zero represents the starting time of an observation. If you're scheduling out the whole thing, your starting time for a given observation I cannot be within the observing window of, of an observation j right so this is just a very dense way of writing that i cannot schedule an observation during another observation and i also cannot schedule an observation during a keep out for that particular target with again keep outs being fairly deterministic in terms of your orbit or your observatory location on the earth and the absolute time this now represents a dynamic program that is also super hard to solve, but given how well CPSAT appears to be working, we've now started building this into a satisfiability program and trying to convert all of this into additional logic uh, and then seeing what those solvers can do. Um, and sadly, I don't have a result for this yet, but I thought that some of you might be interested in, in kind of the things that we're thinking about and how to apply these very, very cool sets of tools to both the ultra mundane, such as reading PhD applications and to the possibly more interesting, such as scheduling uh, astrophysical or planetary observatories. So that's it. Um, obviously I'm low key obsessed with this formalism. And so to me, everything looks like a satisfiability problem, but it, it's kind of shocking how many things can be represented as integer programming problems when you stare at them for long enough. And if any of you have a cool science allocation problem that you're working on uh, and would like to chat about, please let me know because I'm always looking for more of these things to think about. So I will end there. And if anybody has any questions about anything, please, please go ahead and ask.